We are back with the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T, and look who is in the house. Wow. I am not one what? to direct attention what? to myself, what? but I've been talking to these guys through a computer computer monitor, excuse me, for probably, I don't know, a year and a half. Yep. Sam, zoom in on this guy. We had Something. to do Give this uh, last year, but this year, it just took a little while for me to get in studio with the guys. But look, what, I'm what? here. Yeah. In the building, like, I'm no longer a he, hologram. He's intelligent, but he's not artificial intelligence. <laughs> he's actually here. I love it. <laughs> oh, gosh. So we are back here with the Falcons Audible. Thanks again for joining us. Let me give you a quick rundown of what we're going to be covering today in this podcast. We're going to take out our magic wand. And you know what? I forgot to actually get my prop. Our magic <laughs> wand, my something that magic. we are going to change from the Falcons game last weekend against Washington. We're going to rate our concern level on the Falcons finishing games. Obviously, they were in the driver's seat. They were not able to finish the game. We are going to talk a little bit about Cordero, Scordero Patterson in the game <laughs> that he had. Had what you last mean. weekend. We'll get into a little bit of a debate about the Sunday night football matchup. Were you more impressed with Tom Brady or Bill Belichick? And then we will take a look ahead at the Falcons matchup against the Jets as they travel, as they say, across the pond to play For in sure. London. So let's go ahead and get right into it. We will talk about this matchup against the Washington football team last weekend. Guys, I want to do this magic wand, okay? So let's get into the fourth quarter, okay? The Falcons are up by eight points. They get the ball back. I believe there was somewhere around 12 40 12 45 12 48 left in the game yeah here's kind of the rule okay maybe you end up bending the rules a little bit we will arch yeah. we will yeah. i'll start we will. with you here <laughs> no i'm bending if the you rules. could Go make to the wave your first. magic wand or maybe your magic eraser <laughs> and change something that happened in the game yeah because maybe it was the wrong <laughs> decision or you think something could have happened differently to change the outcome what would it be yeah and he just stole my magic wand there you go. I, I, i'm, I'm so actually gonna to cheat you. right off the start okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna all right go ahead be very transparent bend the this rules this is a cheat i'm gonna bend it i'm waving, waving my magic wand and i'm gonna take my Myself all the way back to the first quarter, the opening drive of the game. Atlanta puts a number of plays. They get an eight-minute drive, and you get down there, third and seven from the seven-yard line, third and goal from the seven. Ryan tries to shove the ball down the field. The pit's releasing vertically. If you remember, it was a three-by-one set. He releases vertically up the field, had another player run into the corner, mm -hmm. and Alame oh, Zacchaeus is running the shallow drag route. If I could re-rack it, they had really good protection. Take a look at Pitts. Take the coverage there and find Zacchaeus, who's wide open yeah. coming inside on the drag route. It's a walk-in touchdown, guys. And that eight-minute drive finishes with a demoralizing touchdown as opposed to, whew, we got off the field and only gave up three. And then you get the touchdown in the next drive. Now it's 14 nothing, and the game looks completely different. Dave, let me throw this back at you. As a quarterback, now Matt Ryan has had a, a, a phenomenal career, right? So you don't want to think that he's locking into a target. But you get Kyle Pitts, the prize tight end, the matchup nightmare, down in the red zone. That's where tight ends become a – do you think maybe he locked too much into Kyle Pitts saying there's no way that he loses this matchup and doesn't actually read the play like he needed to because it sounds like he just didn't read it and see Zacchaeus coming across the formation? I, I think you're bang on. I think I think it's the safest throw, right? I got a six foot six tight end that's got a 7'2 wingspan. I can throw the ball cross ball, cross ball high, uh, height or higher. Yeah. He's going to catch it, or the first guy in the, exactly. in the section of the <laughs> cheering section is going to catch it. It's my safest throw, and I get out of here with three, as opposed to hanging on to it and finding Zacchaeus, who he did it at the end of the game last time. Remember, yeah. at the end yeah. of the first half last time, found Zacchaeus after looking at Pitt's left, found Zacchaeus against the Giants for the touchdown. Very similar play here. Just wasn't patient enough. I'd love to be able to and re rackly that. You like what I did there? Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Very like well that. done. Two weeks in a row. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, there are plays you work on every single week in practice. And I'm sure, I guarantee you, that was the number one play they wanted in the red zone there. And they probably worked on it 100 times that week and said, this is what we're going to get. And if you throw it at that high point. And the crazy thing is he, he's made that play. We've all seen him make that play in practice in the game. And he probably more than likely said, 
I want to see if I can give my big man a shot at it. And just for the people that are watching, one of the things you got to remember when you're watching a football game, when you get deep in the red zone and you see quarterbacks throw the football high, there's a reason for that. They are coached to throw the football face mask or higher, especially when you get a target like Kyle Pitts because it's the hardest throw to defend defensively. So don't think when you get down in the red zone and a quarterback throws the ball high, it was a bad throw. Nine times, maybe 9.9 times out of 10, he is trying to throw the football up there. Okay, DJ. Pass it off. Thank Pass you, Arch. Wand, baby. Your magic wand time. What are you changing from last weekend's game? All right, I'm actually going to, because you guys always say I'm the guy who always breaks the rules and goes <laughs> a little bit longer or, you know, we want a quick, and some say quick, but Arch broke the rules, so I'm going to stay within the rules. Okay, okay. I'm going to stay in the fourth quarter. I'm going to go to that next to last drive where we go three and out. And I'm going to go to that first play where we get a, a, a negative three-yard run. And you watch the film, me and Arch just talked about it. There are a lot of things that happen within that play that – probably was the reason why it didn't work or why, you know, it should have went the Falcons' way. But for me, my mind goes to, in that instance, everybody knows you want to run the football. Washington loaded up the box. They got seven, eight guys in the box. And I'm thinking throughout that ball game, you were very successful when you went that little short play action and you hit maybe a little a skinny post behind it or a little slant behind it. You get really on the outside. Or you can even put Kyle Pitts' big body on the outside and – Let's go a little play action here, increase it, and give you a chance to throw a little a ball there. Now, I perfectly understand the call. I understand why you run the football. You're trying to run the clock out. Absolutely. I guarantee you. But since we got the magic wand, yep. and, yep. hey, we got a little hindsight here, I say let's throw the rock there. Give our guy a chance to make a play. And now maybe you pick up a first down. Maybe you pick up seven, eight yards on that particular play. But it's something out of the norm of what was expected from the defense who were selling out on that play for the run. And I just think you might have had a better chance at trying to find a completion there as opposed to trying to run it into the teeth. So it's so interesting you say that. It's a great point because, guys, this is, this is the interesting spot. When you get in the fourth quarter and you've got a lead, but there's still plenty of time on the clock right. as a play caller, how do you approach play calling, yeah. right? And it's kind of like – You can never win, of course, if you end up losing the game because if you run the football and you get stopped, people will say, why didn't you throw the ball? And you throw it. Should have thrown the ball. And then if you throw the ball, you go three (laughs) and out. They're saying, why don't you run the football and just run the clock out? No doubt. So obviously when you come up on the short side, that's when everybody second guesses you. But as a play caller, it's not always that easy, Arch. Like you can't just sit there and say, oh, he should have thrown the football because – Sometimes the logical decision is run it and run the clock out, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and the measurement there is you were right on – it was 352 left. Where is the the line of debarkation here yeah. as to when you begin thinking clock and eating their timeouts or when you think, okay, I've got to get a first down regardless of what it means I throw it or not. So they were right on the edge. Of it. Remember, four-minute offense is when you're trying to grind the clock down yep. and win it. I, to me, I think that that's just outside the range when I begin to think about trying to eat clock. My number one priority there was to get a first down. Yep. And I, I would agree with Shock. Now, there was some illegalities that went on, <laughs> if that's the right word. <laughs> there, they got away with a defensive holding Googling call that, 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 that really, thwarted, huh. yeah, really thwarted the play. Yeah. But, yeah, when you think about a little RPO there or something like that where you get in behind, how much – let me ask you guys as a debate – How much does Atlanta's inability to catch the ball consistently in the game? Ridley had three drops in the game. I think we probably had six balls dropped in the game. If I'm a play caller and I want to run clock as well as get a first down, am I thinking – and you can't hedge your bet and say, oh, my guy's going to drop it. But how much does that put some hesitancy in your mind? I don't want to throw it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it could be the same thing if if you have a running back that's coughed the football up a couple times in the game. You might have a stud running back that this is his job to grind the clock out. True. But maybe in the first half he put the ball on the turf two times. Same thing could be said, Dave. You're not going to sit there and think he's going to fumble again. But you're thinking about it, yeah. right? Like, we can't afford the ball to come out. DJ, yeah. do you agree? Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I'll kind of add to that to the point of I've heard people say, why not have 84 in the game there because he had the hot hand? Yeah. Well, the big part of you bringing Mike Davis here is to be able to close games out in that fashion. Yeah. And then people say, oh, yeah, Cordell had a good game. But also – My man Mike Davis catches a ball in the flat and runs through 94 people and gets into the end zone. Like, he shows you he can be physical with the ball in his hand. So, I'm not going on to the point of, oh, well, one guy had a hotter hand than another. 
Mike Davis is a bruiser type of back. So uh, you're absolutely right. It can go both ways with how you think about calling those plays going into the latter part of the ball game, depending on what they've been doing. Well, guys, look, I had a play too, but I don't want to belabor the point on the magic wand because I feel like there's some other topics that we want to discuss because you mentioned they brought in Mike Davis to close out the game, to close out games to the Falcons, right? So switching gears here, how, what's our concern level on finishing games? Because I think it's a great segue talking about Mike, Mike Davis needing that dominating running back to break a couple of tackles, to pick up a first down, to keep the clock going, to force the opposing team to burn a couple of timeouts. You thought maybe the Falcons turned a corner a week ago against the Giants. Right. But, Chuck, let me come right back to you. Where is your concern level here? And I'm not going to sit here and give you a meter. you got to give me a 5 to a 10. But just where are you at? Because – if you talk about the best football teams, and this is any level, guys, yeah. it's you got to execute situations. Yeah. Right? It's third down, four minute, short yardage goal line, closing out games. You know what, I, Rick? I say this. I think I'm going off a two game span of we're still too early to tell. And I'll say that because the first game versus Philly, we really we was out of the ball game where at the end you really didn't have a chance. Versus Tampa, yeah, you came back at the end, but you had some deflections, and before you know it, you're down, you know, 14, 17, whatever it is, and you're not able to do it. You mentioned last week versus the Giants where you go and you finish that ball game, and this week you don't finish it. I still think because we have a new staff, you have a bunch of new guys in a bunch of different new spots that are learning how to play with each other, you're still trying to figure out how to close games. So I think it's still too early to say this team is like the 2020 team that didn't finish ball games at the yeah. end. I think you still need to, to have more on tape to say, okay, this is a trend or this is something that we're starting to see because we've seen them do it last week and then you didn't do it this week. So you have a mixture of both. So I think you still need more to say if this is a team that is in that realm of not being able to finish or they can't finish. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. There are officially no more excuses about why you can't get your bathroom fixed or why you can't build a deck in the backyard. Not sure where to start? No problem. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. Their digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, image search, so you'll always know exactly what you need to pick up. Don't have the tools you need? Rent items from drills, blowers, carpet cleaners, generators, and more. Big or small, indoor or out, the Home Depot has the equipment you need. With the tap of a finger, you can reserve equipment ahead of time, swing by, and pick it up and get started. Ready to invest in your own tools? Browse through millions of items from top brands you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. So you guys mentioned Cordero Patterson, where he's getting a nickname of Scordero Patterson. <laughs> I like so I want to ask you guys, and Arch, I'm going to start with you. Is there anything that you see, like, like why is Cordero Patterson coming into his own with Atlanta when he's kind of been a little bit of a journeyman? I mean, he had 11 touches in a game last week, and he scores three touchdowns. If you look at the numbers, not necessarily great, but this guy – it's almost like an exciting play mm -hmm. is waiting to happen. Is this as simple as some guys need a change of scenery and maybe this is the place for him? Maybe it's the play calling? What are you seeing from Cordero Patterson that's making him have so much success? Yeah, because this is what his third stop, right? It started started in Minnesota, then went to Chicago. So uh, I think, first of all, it, it is shows you some of what the brilliance can look like on the offensive side of the ball because, as you mentioned, this is a guy – that had not exploded this way as an offensive offensive weapon. So it gives you an idea of what's going on with Dave Ragone and Arthur Smith to be able to design the ways they're getting this guy the ball. His versatility is off the charts. He can line up out wide as a receiver outside the numbers. He can line up in the slot. He can motion him. You can hand him the ball in the backfield. The variety with which they're using him, I mean, Shock designs and shows a play on, on AtlantaFalcons.com. You'll be able to see where he's got a he, – he releases out of the backfield, but it releases on the far side of the formation to get where he needs to get to, runs through three defenders and scores. He's physical. I think it, what it is is as a guy, as you suggested, he's in a different place, he's comfortable, and he realizes his value to the team. But it's also the defensive people don't know what to declare right. him as. <laughs> right. What yeah. is he? 
Yeah. He's lined up in the slot. He runs right over the top of everybody like a receiver in a slot for a touchdown. The next time it's the play you describe where he comes out of the back as a running back and you just drop him the football yeah. and he scores. He, he, caught the, he caught the back shoulder fade as an outside receiver <laughs> outside the numbers. Three different ways for him to score. I'm excited about it, but I think it also shows you if you're a fan and you're looking, what is this coaching staff giving me? Look at what they're doing with Cordero Patterson and what could they do if they get more guys like him where you just don't know where the ball's going to go. Yeah, and, and I want to add to that real quick, Rack. He, he talked about the fact of defense is not knowing what to declare him. Exactly. There are times he come in the ball game and you have him and Mike Davis in the game, and you're saying, "Oh, is this 22 personnel? Is it two backs? Right. I mean, is it is it 20 personnel? What is this? Or it can be 11 because we can see him line up at receiver at a, the 11 minute point in the ball game going to, into the third quarter." He had lined up seven times in the slot, three times a receiver, seven times a running back, and was four plays on special teams. Yeah. I mean, the dude is everywhere. <laughs> and that's what makes it so fun is the guy can line up all over the field and have that kind of advantage. And you mentioned Dave Ragone. I remember Dave Ragone talking about before the season started, he had been trying to get Cordell Patterson for the last two, three years in his offense. Yeah. So that tells you, in his mind, he already knew how he wanted to use him. And now he's got one with Arthur Smith, and they said, all right, this is the way we can use this guy. We yep. can put this guy in a lot of different ways. And you can tell he feels as though he is a big factor. Cause because every time he touches the football, we talk about it, he wants to go score, he's running through guys, and he's having fun with it. And I think ultimately other guys will see it, and it, it'll definitely kind of wane off those guys as well. It's like he's getting the ball, and he feels like he's going to make a play. Oh, like no he's untouchable. Arch, no can, you, can you remember a time in your <laughs> career where, like, you played with a guy where it was like every time he put his football, his hands on the football, something magical was going to happen. Yeah, so it's, it's the it's the Michael Jordan shrug you game. Hey, everything <laughs> I throw up's going in against the Trailblazers. <laughs> That's certainly what it felt like for Cordell Patterson this weekend. Where wherever he got the football, Shock just described it. He was going to score or make some good happen. I go back to college. I had a kid named Tracy Henderson, who was an All American wide receiver for me, and he had a game where he caught sixteen balls. We're playing at Kansas State. And he caught 16 passes for somewhere around 200 yards and a couple scores. But I felt like I could throw the ball anywhere yeah. around his body. He's snagging it one-handed, down on the ground. I mean, I wasn't that accurate. He's making grabs <laughs> all over the place. I just felt like I'm watching a guy that's in the zone, that's brilliant at doing what he does. And, and that's the thing that came to mind for me when I watched Cordero. I said, wow, this looks like that performance where you just kind of get chills and watch this guy get it done. Let me just get him the ball somewhere and go to work. And Tracy had a monster day. That that immediately came back in my mind. Arch probably thinking, um, Coach, can you get me two or three more <laughs> Tracys because this guy's making me look great. Right, if you can find more guys like that, yeah. that's why you need Calvin Ridley to step up and be that guy that makes every catch that comes. Now all of a sudden, how much more difficult are you to defend? But that's a great point. Now, you mentioned chills, Dave, and there was a game this weekend that if you were a Patriots fan, if you were a Tampa Bay fan or if you were just a football fan maybe this game on Sunday Night Football gave you some chills and DJ I want to start with you this is going to be our little debate segment maybe we end up with a debate maybe we end up with an agreement I'm not quite sure close game in Foxborough obviously Tom Brady comes out on top but it was like the goat yeah. against a rookie yeah. or Tom Brady against his former mentor and Bill Belichick so yeah. the debate discussion is going to be who did a better job? Do you give the edge to Bill Belichick and how he was able to slow down Tom Brady in the Buccaneers' offense, or do you give the edge to Tom Brady? Well, Rack, knowing that I know where this guy is going to go, I'm going to jump on the other side. I'm going to stop talking I'm beforehand. A, I'm going to say it's Tom Brady, but it gives – it's so we don't have to agree. But I'm going to say Tom Brady in this instance because you look at – what he was walking into. This is a place where he played 20 years, the emotion of the game, and then you think on the other side, the guy who he's playing against, I heard him talking in his postgame say, i seen this guy every single day. I know exactly what this guy will do. I know exactly what he's thinking. And to go in this game and to have to battle with not just the fans, not just with the emotion of coming back, not with having to make it a cool video as he's you know coming back into the stadium and talking about how cool it is to be back, but to actually have to play the game. In those circumstances. And then on the other side, he's looking across and he's looking at the protege that they brought in to kind of take over and be him yep. and to outplay him. Think about if he loses that ball game, what people are saying about Tom Brady and how the guy, Mac Jones, actually outplayed him. Yeah. But 
I'm going to say Tom Brady because of all the things that he had to overcome and fight to be in that ball game and to fight and to play. I know he's a veteran, but it's, at the end of the day, we're all still human. We all still get emotional about it. Yeah. And you can see him after the ball game, how much it still meant to him. Uh, him hugging Robert Kraft, you know, before the game. Uh, you know, Belichick coming, talking to him after the game and sitting down talking in the locker room. Like, this was emotionally a lot. And yeah. it's hard to kind of separate those two, even when you've played 20 plus years in the National Football League. So I think you got to give Brady a lot of credit for having his team ready, but also having the ability to go in and play at a standard where he still was able to help his team get a win in such a hostile and crazy environment that he spent pretty much his whole entire life and his kids were born there. Arch, do you give Brady the edge or the architect, as he talked about, Bill Belichick and the game plan that he was able to put together against Tampa? Yeah, Rack, without a doubt, Bill Belichick was the winner in this game. Think about where he had to go with his team mentally on Wednesday when they came in. Here comes the Super Bowl champs. Here comes the GOAT. Here comes the guy that's got seven trophies on his, on his table. They're going to be cheering him when he gets here. He had to get his young quarterback ready to go because he was facing the guy that had been the man there. His young quarterback came in and played great in the game, the former Alabama, Mac Jones. And he also had to get a defense convinced that they could beat him. So he had to build them all the week long with all the talk about Brady and Brady's this and Brady's that. Look at the trophies. In fact, when you come to the facility, you got to walk by the trophies. <laughs> you got to walk by his picture. No, Belichick had his guys dialed in. It didn't hurt that it was pouring down. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Horrible <laughs> conditions. Yeah, <laughs> and I would say Belichick had something to do with that, too. <laughs> he ordered in the bad weather as well. So you got to figure that Belichick got his team ready to go, got his young quarterback ready to go, and he brought in bad weather to this crew with Brady. So I'd give Belichick the W. Oh, man. So Arch thinking that Belichick is just sitting here writing game plans, and then, by the way, he's like, Mother Nature. <laughs> Bring the rain. That's right. <laughs> Bring it down. All right, so I'll just uh, go ahead come and, on, and come break on. the tie break here. The tie. DJ, who won the game? The Bucks, baby. Tom Brady gets the edge. Yeah. In the NFL, it's Thank all you. about who Thank wins you. games. Good and try, yes, Good try. there are there was so much on the shoulders of Mac Jones, so much on the shoulders of the Patriots, but there was yeah. so much on the shoulders of Tom Brady. This wasn't really the Buccaneers going back to Foxborough. This, this was Tom Brady no no going doubt. back to Foxborough. No doubt. And yes, his statistics did not look great. Yeah. But in the end, sometimes it might be ugly. But your job in the NFL is to do what? Win. Win. Yeah, but he had yeah. mommy and daddy nah. in the crowd. They were taking <laughs> so, uh, care of him. He was fine. So Belichick dials up the, the weather. <laughs> Tom Brady just brings in mom and dad. That's, yeah. That's all it takes. That's right. All right, guys, good stuff there. Okay, so let's go ahead and just take a quick look this week. And, of course, the Falcons are going across the pond. They're going to face the New York Jets, another team with a first-year head coach. I want you guys to give us kind of your thoughts going into this matchup. Where do you think the headspace is for Atlanta and how you see this game end up unfolding, Arch? Well, much like here when you, when you emerged from last week, you had a really good feeling about yourself. Got a win on the road. Did a good job of, of closing the game out. We talked about that. Really did a nice job of that. So you came back with some energy. And I thought that you saw that energy early in the football game. I thought you saw the energy throughout. They just didn't play well enough to get the W this weekend. That's what the Jets bring to the table. Jets have struggled. Their quarterback struggled two weeks ago through a couple of interceptions. Really bad interceptions a couple of weeks ago. Came back. He made himself better that week. Getting ready for the game. They get a W. And they got after people on defense. I think what they have seven sacks in the game. Mm -hmm. Their defense played at an extremely high level. He was able to get some of his receivers uh, back. Jamerson Crowder was back. Uh, Denzel Mims was back. So he had some of his weapons around. They feel pretty good about themselves. So I would say from a mental standpoint, the Jets go into this game maybe in a better spot mentally than Atlanta goes mm -hmm. into this game. Uh, so Atlanta going to have to, much like this game this last weekend where we saw so many ebbs and flows of momentum, Atlanta's going to have to go build their own momentum yeah. in this game because yeah. I think the Jets bring it with them. Yeah, and, and DJ, obviously in this game, it's not like one team has the advantage over the other when it comes to travel because they right. both have to travel. It's difficult. It's hard to navigate. A lot of times, I think in these games, it shows your leadership and how well do your leaders, not just your players, but your coaches as well, keep everybody together, yeah. keep them focused because guys are going to go over there. They're going to be tired. They're going to want to go to sleep. And it's like, okay, no, we got we got to get adjusted to the schedule. But how do you see this one unfolding where Atlanta is and where the Jets are right uh, now? I love what you mentioned. Both of you guys mentioned make some great points about how this team has to go out and play this ball game. And from my standpoint, I think of it as the leader saying, okay, we had the first quarter of the season. As we all know, you play the first four games, that first quarter is done. If you have the real leaders in this locker room, they're going to say, let's flush that. That's gone. 
We can't do anything about one and three. But we do. We're starting the second quarter here. The second quarter starts now, and we got an opportunity to go on the road and go win a ball game versus a team that's feeling really confident. Everybody expects the Falcons, just like last week, to go in and win this ball game. But as we know, you have to play the ball game. Jets come in with huge confidence. They got a young quarterback that's starting to feel better about himself. But here's an opportunity for the veterans of this team to say this is still a business trip. This is still a long season, and it starts right now in the second quarter of finishing what we started, which is going out and winning ball games. and it starts right here and right now. We go out, we get a win, and we come back, and it makes that flight from London a lot yeah. better when you get a W. So, yes. you know, hopefully the veterans of this team emphasize how big and how important it is to start this second quarter the right way and do some of the things that maybe you didn't do well in those first four games like finish ball games, mm-hmm. like make the plays that are there when yep. they're presented, yep. and get a W so you feel better going into the start of this second quarter of the season. As we know, it starts to get a little bit harder when you start playing teams that are you know have a much better record. What do you um, mean, Chuck? Should I, should, so i got to cancel the tour of Buckingham Palace? I can't go get my picture taken with Ben, Big, Big Ben? I can't stand with Parliament in the background? That's the kind of stuff he's talking about yep. is, okay, that's – you may have never been there before. There's a bunch of young players on this yep. football team. Hey, this is England. I've never been to it. Maybe you've never That's even it. been to a different country. That's it. Got to flush that out of your mind. He's yeah. exactly right. I got to lock in and go play football. Yeah. And, and guys, you, you made a great point, point, DJ. We've been on some flights after losses, and they've been, what, an hour and a half, two hours, maybe three and a <laughs> half hours. But you come back on a loss on a nine-hour flight. <laughs> yeah. And you go to one and four, yeah. and the coaches ain't too happy, and the yeah. players are upset. That makes for a long flight back home. For sure. Guys, look, I was so happy to be back in the studio Good with you. Good to see you, man. Let's do this, Good huh? Let's do this. Thank I you like so it. much for joining us here on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. Of course, wherever you. you end up downloading and watching your podcast, whether that's Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com, YouTube, whichever one it is, we thank you for going on that medium because without you watching us, we're not even here doing this. Hey, hey shout out to Jill, Give Archer's wife right here. <laughs> watching the show, we appreciate you. I got ball Archer's wife is, is kind, of, kind of judgmental on the camera. Camera yeah. angles sometimes. So we How do you might... like my camera angle now, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all so much for joining us here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. We'll be back next week. Thanks so much.